Heads up, listeners. This episode deals with mental health and suicide. Please use discretion, as we know stories like this can be triggering for some. Most importantly, if you or a loved one is in crisis, please reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK or the Crisis Text Line, text T-A-L-K to 741-741 to chat with someone who can help. To both learn more about suicide and also the resources available to survivors of suicide loss, visit the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org. I've been lucky enough to realize my gift. And that's why I want people to see that they have a gift. If I have a gift after 22 suicide attempts, after the the, the, the mistakes that I've made time and time again after life, then I, I believe we all have one. I mean, that's just truth be told. And, and I stand firm on that. On March 11th, 2005, Kevin Berthia became famous for all the wrong reasons. Like, I'm not famous for something I wanted to be famous for. Okay, like everybody want to be front page of the paper, but not that type of way. Look at that picture. It's one you'll never forget. That's Kevin. Kevin's photo made it to the front page of the Saturday edition of the San Francisco Chronicle. For everyone else, his parents, friends and family, this was the first time they knew Kevin to be suicidal. But the truth is that he'd already attempted to take his own life 13 times. Today, Kevin is miles away from where he used to be. Rather than contemplating the end of his life, he's been on an incredible and unlikely journey away from despair and towards hope. He now spends his time speaking up for mental health and suicide prevention with a message that has made it around the world. So get ready for a wild ride through Kevin's life story and the serendipitous events that led him to becoming a nationally renowned storyteller. From Eating Recovery Center and Pathlight Mood and Anxiety Center, you are listening to Mental Note Podcast. I'm Ellie Pike. So kind of when did you notice you were on a mental health journey? I I knew early in life because as early as age five years old, I knew I knew I was different. I struggled a lot early growing up because, you know, my mom told me early in life that I was adopted. So I was able to be adopted, you know, into a two parent home, African-American community by you know African-American couple. So, you know, I look like I fit in, even though to me, I didn't look like anybody. And it was a struggle for me every day going outside into the world because we identify who people are by who, you know, who they belong to. You know, sisters look alike, cousins look alike, mom looks like the daughter, dad looks like the, and I never looked like anybody. So I always had this yearning of trying to figure out where I belong. Sounds like you really had trouble with your sense of belonging and your identity, especially which for many of us that comes from our family. So how did that play into your depression and suicidal ideation? I think that um, the idea of how could somebody give birth to me, look at me and give me up. I think that that I still, even to this day at 39, I'll be 40 this year, and it's still something I can't, I can't understand, you know? And so for me growing up, I've never felt like, you know, good enough. So it just, it just, I was always so hard on myself and I never prepared myself um, to live a life to that, that I saw myself having a future in. You know, I didn't care about 10 years from now, you know, because if you asked me 10 years from now what I was going to be, who I was going, where I was going to be at, I, I thought I was going to be dead. Like, I didn't think I was going to make it to be an adult. Wow, Kevin, just even hearing you say that, I know you're saying that so much in past tense, but that is such a heavy reality of being a kid. You were, what, five, ten years old, having thoughts of, I don't really want to be here anymore. Why am I even here and you didn't talk about him, is that right? I didn't. You know, I, I was a smart kid. I know how to think about it because I knew early in life that we don't question people when they're happy. 
or when they look or appear to be happy. If somebody's smiling, you don't say, you know, look at them and say, no, nah, you really are in a bad, in a dark place. You you go off the face value of what they look like. So I knew early in life, as long as my outside didn't match my inside, that I, I could always get past. And so I just always kept it to myself because it was easier handling my battles. At least I thought it was easier handling my battles internally. You know, when things would happen, I would open myself up um, and, and literally put it in a box. I would, you know, open up a door inside of myself, inside of my brain and whatever trauma, whatever pain, whatever, whatever it is, I would put it in a box and close the door. And I've done that. I did that my whole life. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know so many people can relate to that feeling of like, I think I can handle this better on my own, but it, it starts to um, bubble and grow. And if we don't explode, I think a lot of us would implode, right? Like there's got to be some kind of breaking point. And I know you'll share a little bit more about that with us. But as you grew up, can you tell us what it was like to transition from elementary to junior high? Yeah, that was a that that particular transition was tough during that same time frame of switching schools. I was my parents went through a divorce. So I not only had to deal with an environmental change of, you know, my school, you know, and change of the environment, my my parents divorcing triggered this pain on the inside of me. Well, it was the first time that I I felt adopted. Like, you know, cuz during that time my parents was married, I never felt adopted. I hated the idea of being adopted, but I never felt adopted. When my parents divorced, it was the first time I felt alone in the world. And I'm that uh, that alone feeling triggered all this anger and, 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 and rage on the inside of me. So when I went to school, I matched the individuals at school who had e all these other emotional issues um, from family. And it's like we matched. It's like it was a perfect match. And so I, I used that rage. So I was great and making people feel horrible about themselves because it not it, it it didn't make me feel good about myself it just kept people away from me and in identifying what was really going on with me and what would the risk have been if you had you know shared your feelings or even uh, felt more approachable to people um back then laughed at talked about your reputation so you got to realize something i was born and raised in oakland california so your reputation starts at kindergarten like we were, we, we've never been allowed to be kids because our, your reputation, I've watched kids, something happened to them one day and, and they are in so much scared, fear of what would, people will say. They, they have to change schools, you know, and it's just, that's just the reality of what it was. So I knew that I could, I had to always make sure that I always was dotting all my I's and crossing all my T's because I couldn't afford you know, a meltdown of a, a, a emotional meltdown. Cause that's all it was. I'm a very emotional person. But people would never know that because I always went away from that emotion and just, you know, I, I treated it, treated it with anger. So it was easier for me to be angry on the inside than emotional on the inside, because when I'm emotional on the inside, you know, I'm a crybaby. So I can't be a crybaby at the, in the situation that I'm in. Definitely not. Well, and I remember you actually in our first conversation, conversation, saying something along the lines of if I show my emotions, I would have gotten beat up. So it was this yeah. like survival instinct that you had yeah, to put, that's what it was. put this I mean, like front out there. You had, but you had to, you show, you show sign of weakness. That's it. You know, you, you're, 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 you know, this blood and it's blood in the water for your whole school year. And you don't want that. Like, you know, who wants that? And I just, that was always my biggest fear. Sounds like you really used your survival mechanisms to just create the best scenario for yourself that you could have created, which was yeah. really protective of your reputation, of yourself, you know, not being too vulnerable in a place that wasn't safe for you to be. And then you were dealing with all the emotions of being adopted, having your parents divorce, questioning why, you know, why did your birth parents give you up? and having so many other social cultural factors on top of that. So I'm curious at what point you really were, were like, gosh, I'm going to stop just thinking about suicide. And, you know, I really want to act on my thoughts. Uh, 14. At 14 was my first suicide attempt. Nobody ever knew about. Um, that was after a back and forth living with my parents. Um, 15 was, was, I was all over the place. Um, you know, that's when I rage started happening and start punching holes in wall. I mean, it was just, it was, I was in a bad place. Um, I remember on my 16th birthday, it's just, you know, I hated life. And my mom just, she just looked at me one day and just said, you know, I, I gotta get something, I, I gotta do something to get me out of this place that I was in. You know, I, I can understand how far you've come because I've heard your story before, but let's, 
Let's go back a little bit in time when you didn't have the words to express your emotions and when you did allow it to compound and compound and compound and and feel so triggered that you didn't feel like you could live with yourself. And you know, I I found you because I saw your story on Instagram through the Good News Movement. And I'll let you share the story. But I remember looking at at your picture being like, what in the world? We have to talk to him. He has something to share. So tell us a little bit or a lot um, about your experience on the bridge. March 11, 2005, I drove myself to the Golden Gate Bridge. I was 22 years old. Um, I probably, I think that was attempt, I want to say 13 Um up until that point. So I was trying to look for something. Um, When I woke up that morning, March 11, 2005, everything that I have compounded and put into a box and closed the door, um, it was like every door was open. Every box was open. uh, Every emotion that I didn't deal with, I felt. And I couldn't get to the point of containing anything. I didn't have anything. I I didn't have a door to close. Like everything was open. I couldn't put anything anywhere in it. My anxiety was all over the place. And I got up, finally got up that morning and I said, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't, I can't continue to do this because I don't even know why I'm doing it. That morning I got up and as my, as I'm pumping my gas, my brain clicked and said, Golden Gate Bridge. So I finally get out there um, from getting lost and I get to the bridge, a park, and I leave my keys in the ignition and I'm, I'm, I'm because I, you know, Turn the car off, leave the keys right there. I'm not coming back. If anything was going to stop me, it would have stopped me before I got here. So this has to be meant to be. And I still went out there and I walked for about 15 minutes, you know, which felt like five hours because I was still trying to find one thing, one reason not to jump. And I couldn't find it. Like I could, I surveyed my whole life and all I saw was pain. All I saw was being a failure. All I saw was, you know, being a burden. All I saw was having to live this life for the rest of my life. I make the decision, it's like, okay, this is it. And so I looked over the railing, and when I looked over the railing, I saw the water. I saw there was nothing going to deter me from getting in that water. But when I looked in the water and I looked down, um, it was the first time in my life that I saw peace. At least I thought was peace. Because for me, I thought, if I I jump into this water, I don't have to be a burden anymore. I don't have to wake up and feel worthless. I take a couple steps back and I brace myself for impact. And I know this is going to be over. And it's like, this peace that comes over me. I literally jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and as I'm in the air, uh, my first responder, Sergeant Briggs, who I didn't even know he was my first responder. I didn't know he was a sergeant, a cop. I knew nothing about it. We still don't even know exactly what was said, but it was enough to get me out of the, to distract me from the place that I was in. As I'm in the air and I literally grab grab the railing with one arm and I came down and I and somehow my feet got onto this four inch cord that's underneath the railing. And from the top, you can't see the railing. So from the top, he thinks I jumped. And I, I remember just being in this situation, being and I kept my eyes closed the whole time because I couldn't believe that I wasn't in the water. No, no part of my body is holding on. The only thing that's holding me up is the wind because it's, you know, March in San Francisco. So the wind is the wind chill is like literally holding me up against the railing. Um, you know, finally, he is able to just get close enough to talk to me. And I, I kept my head down, uh, my eyes closed the whole time. And literally um, for the next 92 minutes, he literally just listen to me and I spoke to him about everything that I've wanted to say everything I wanted to tell my biological dad my biological mother my adoptive mom my my adoptive dad my sisters my teammates my coaches everything that I want to tell the people that I didn't get a chance to say to people he learned in 92 minutes and he just listened he just sat there and he just listened to me I never once like I say I never looked up never knew he's a cop never knew he was white Never knew anything about him. All I had in my brain was that this was a, you know, another human. In 2005, I had never had a great encounter with law enforcement being born, being, 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 you know, being born in Oakland you know, and raised in Oakland, California. So if I would open my eyes and realize this was a white cop, I wouldn't be here today. 
nothing about me will be here today. So I, how did I, and everybody said, well, how do you know he listened to you? I talked about all these different things and it was only one thing that brought me back. Like my daughter, that was it. Like and he, it was a different emotion when I talked about her. He made me realize like I went to the bridge March 11, 2005. Kevin, you're going to miss our first birthday. Like I wouldn't even have been there and I would have missed out everything if I would have succeeded, you know, at, at, you know, completing this. I went to hospital for like 14 days after that, got home. My mom, she showed me that picture and it was, it was March 12th, Saturday edition. So I immediately told her, we're never talking about this day. I went for eight years on a lie, acting like that day never existed. I don't know how you drive to the Golden Gate Bridge, literally jump off of it, have a helicopter, you know, have a picture, a photo that goes front page of the paper where the world knows and you yourself don't accept it. While it took Kevin eight years before he finally acknowledged how perilously close to death he'd come on the bridge, depression does not need to carry so much shame. One of the best ways to short circuit denial and self-hatred is to frankly talk about it. So let's do that. We'll get back to Kevin's story in just a minute, but in the meantime, I wanna introduce you to Dr. Thomas Joyner. My name is Thomas Joyner. I'm a professor of psychology at Florida State University area of expertise is suicide prevention. Dr. Joyner is going to walk us through the basics of depression, suicidal thoughts, and some of the tools available for finding lasting freedom. Well, depression is a very common um, disorder or or condition. And and suicidal thinking is often part and parcel of of the condition. That's not necessarily a very, very high concern in itself. However, there are levels and, and there are some that, that do get serious indeed. And what we do in our clinic is we just ask people to rate it on a zero to 10 scale with zero being there's no intent whatsoever and 10 being there's definite, immediate intent, very high. And we just ask for that number. And I find that number to be extremely informative. Now, you can't base everything on that one number, obviously, but it gives you a lot of information. And so with depression, the ones you get worried about have that suicidal element, but not only that, it's that element that has intent in it. And for the loved one who might be speaking to someone who has any kind of suicidal intent or plan, what is the best advice for that individual? Because I know as a loved one, it can feel really challenging. Do I bring this up? Do I talk about it? If I talk about it, it could make it worse. What is the right answer, and do we have any research to back it up? We have a lot of research that, that makes it really plain that, that talking about it does not cause it. Uh, on the contrary, if anything, on the contrary, talking about it um, takes some of the edge off of it, relieves it. So I would encourage people to bring it up. It's a challenging topic to bring up. That's true. I think that truth should be faced and acknowledged, shouldn't be glossed over. But People should remember that they're not mental health professionals themselves, so the, the pressure to be one shouldn't shouldn't be on them. It should be on a on a credentialed mental health professional. And so reaching out to professionals like that is crucial. And then and reaching out for immediate support is, is probably sensible too. And and there's lots of resources these days in that regard. One that comes to mind is one 800 273 talk which is this summer going to transition to a 911 like number namely 988 you know resources like that are, are very informative and, and suicidal people themselves can utilize that resource but so can concerned you know loved ones and then these days you know a lot of people like to text they, they, some people like to text more than they they like to talk on the phone necessarily and so there's crisis text line dot org it's just one word crisis text line one word dot org and, and you can text and, and get similar advice and support. So those are some pretty simple ideas, along with a, a very important one, which is that by and large, a little bit of care, a little bit of support, a little bit of warmth goes a long way with creatures that are as social and, and gregarious as we are. I think you bring up such a good point of just bringing up the topic shows how much care that individual has for the person at risk 
and is suffering from depression. So creating that connection and that warmth can really be the antidote to a lot of those suicidal thoughts. Is there any other advice that you um, provide individuals who might be dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts? Common sense behavioral measures go farther than people give them credit for. What do I mean by that? I mean things like um, waking up in the morning at a regular routine time, fairly early in the morning, you know, that takes discipline. And that's the trick. That's the trick of this, that, that depression can undermine discipline and motivation. Both. That's, that is true. That is a trick, but there's a skill called opposite action from a, a therapy called dialectical behavior therapy. In a nutshell, all that means is like, just like it sounds, do the opposite. And for, for depressed folks, they feel like staying in bed. They feel like not going out or going outside. They should do the opposite force, the opposite, which is moving around, getting outside. There's evidence that sunlight is a, is a pretty good antidepressant, especially morning sunlight, along with, you know, I mentioned our inherent natures uh, a minute ago being, you know, one thing social. We need each other. We need interpersonal contact. Small doses go a long way even just showing up to some event where there are other people in the community, in the neighborhood, and what, what have you. Um, similarly, we're, we're, we're creatures that evolved in, in biological nature. Uh, what I mean by that is that nature is important to us. It speaks to our minds and our souls. And so getting out in the, in the sunlight, in the woods, playing with pets, whatever aspect of the natural world, interacting with it, it, it's an antidepressant in itself. Those are not hard things, except that depression makes them hard because it undermines the discipline to do them. And for them to work, they need to be done routinely, daily, pretty much. With depression, it, it's a it's a trickster, and, and, the, and, and one of its tricks is to take away the very thing that you need to do these things, namely discipline and, and motivation and, and energy. That's why opposite action is a pretty important principle. And the importance of bringing a, a team alongside of you for that support, because depression is saying, please don't do this, or you're lacking the motivation to use the discipline that's needed. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Joyner. I really appreciate the feedback that you've given us and the, the, the tools and the insight. Um, is there anything that you would like to add before we sign off? Well, I would just add that treatments work. Um, they're not perfect. We have, we have a long ways to go in terms of perfecting and optimizing medication as a treatment and psychotherapy as a treatment, but they both work. And so hand in hand with those other things, things like getting outside, moving around, socializing, interacting with nature, sunlight exposure, hand in hand with that, if somebody can get on a medication and see a therapist regularly, all those things are easier and easier these days with access and telehealth and, and, and et cetera. So that's the package that, that you need to fight this if you're vulnerable to it, because it's a serious condition and, and it, it requires a serious fight. That idea of opposite action that Dr. Joyner talked about is really powerful. Let's get back to Kevin to find out how a surprise trip to New York City and a bit of scheming from his mom prompted him into a series of radical opposite actions. Together, they proved strong enough to finally break his tenacious eight-year denial and fuel him into a different life. So, um, eight years go by. Um, we're at we're in 2013 now, and I am probably um, in the worst place ever. Uh, I'm back in the same place I was. Um, in 2005 mentally, I just, I just, I can't get out of this rut. And I told myself, all right, this is about to be, I literally knew I wasn't going to make it out of 2013. I knew it. I knew it. Nobody else did, but I knew, I knew I wasn't going to make it out. Um, March comes around and I remember my mom, um, coming to me and she's like, you know, um, um, I got some radio station tickets. You, you just go right. And, and my mom was banking on me, not asking no questions, just to get on a plane, go to New York, you know, and not ask no questions. And that's what I did. So I get out there and I remember going down the stairs and it's a guy holding my 
my my name, Berthia, with a with a tag. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is getting a, you're getting like a VIP limo. treatment. Yeah, Wait, you, you get you in the, the limo. limo? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You know, they saw that, you know, you get in there, we get a ride, we get to the hotel. The phone is blinking red light. I got a message and it's from the radio station. They want me to call. So I'm thinking I'm about to call them and bust a bubble and let them know ah, I'm not my mom. Because your mom has said that, can you go in my place, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's basically what it was. I mean, I don't even really know what she said. So she's I mean, conning she say too much. It was just New York and free. I mean, I don't know. My favorite word is free. So I don't care. Once I hear free, it don't matter. All other questions are out the door. So I called a radio station back and I'm going to tell them, you know, I'm not my mom. You know, I hope, you know, they don't try to send me back home or something or, you know, whatever the case may be. And as soon as I get on the phone, the guy is so ecstatic. He is like, oh, my God, Kevin Berthia, we're so excited to interview you. Oh, my God. We're so excited to talk to you about your eight year reunion, your eight year reunion with your first responder. And I'm like, what? Let me call you right. Look, can I can I just call you right back? I just got into the hotel room and I call my mom back. I said, "Mom, what am I doing out here?" She said, "Oh, oh, you're gonna meet the man in the in the photo, Officer Briggs." Mom, you you could have said something. She knew I never would have left California. Right. I never would have left. So I get on the air and it's just like no dead air time, and I talk openly about things that led up to that day. Kevin's surprises did not end with the radio interview. That night, he was scheduled to speak at a formal awards ceremony alongside Sergeant Kevin Briggs of the California Highway Patrol, the very person who helped save his life. So we leave there, we go to the Columbus Circle, and we I'm all decked out in this tuxedo, and, I, I, and now I know I'm meeting Officer Briggs, so now my anxiety is all over the place. I don't know, technically this guy did save me. I don't know what kind of person he is, if he wants me to like bow at him or kiss his feet. I don't know. But I remember meeting him for the first time at the cocktail hour and I shook his hand and it was like two old high school buddies that haven't seen each other in 20 years. That's that's what it felt like. It's like I knew this man my whole life. As soon as I shook his hand, I knew exactly how and why he saved me. Um, it was just, it was it's something about him. And I just believe that people are destined to be in your life for a reason and that that's just what it is. So I remember him shaking his hand and we took a couple pictures and then we went into the event and everybody's at a table, everybody's all decked up. And I remember Briggs gets up there and he starts talking and I'm facing the crowd, just like I'm like this and the crowds, you know, looking behind me at the, at the jumbo train. I don't know why this thing is so big, but it's like huge. And the Yahoo documentary goes up and the picture, you know, goes up on the screen and the whole crowd goes <gasps> like that. Right. So I, you know, I bite, I want to know what they're looking at because I'm looking up at the crowd. Like, you know, I'm looking this way. I'm not looking at the screen. You know, I probably should have been turned around, but <laughs> I turn around and I look at it and it's the third time I'm seeing this picture. And they always say third time's a charm, right? Third time I'm looking at this picture, I accepted it was me in that photo. It was probably one of the most powerful moments in my life. And as I accepted it in my brain, it opened up my heart. And I remember, you know, five minutes later, I was on stage talking openly about everything that happened and that led up to that day, March 11, 2005. I remember after I after I got done, I could I felt the weight of the world off of me. Like it was like I can't explain. It was like these weights were dropping as I'm talking. By the time I got done, it was like the weight of the world wasn't on me. It was just like I felt so much better because it's like like this is who I am. Like you know, I, I'm not. I don't have to lie about who I am anymore. And I remember you know after I was done, everybody stood up. This is my first time I've ever spoke in my life. So to have people stand up and give me a standing up. So I was I'm walking down. People are clapping, and I remember people are starting to form a line. And I'm thinking, you know, it's either the food line or I don't know what type of line this is. But, you know, I remember the first lady in line, she was emotionally all over the place. She was crying. She said, I need you to look at me. I have to explain something to you. Um, she said, my son Jacob lost his battle five years ago. Um, she said, I haven't slept in five years. She said, and I couldn't, I, I put my head down as soon as she said he lost his battle because I knew Without knowing, I knew what she was talking about. Like, she said, I'm going to sleep tonight. And the only reason why I'm going to sleep is because you told your story. I can better understand what Jacob was going through now. And as soon as she said that, I put my head up and I looked at her in her eyes and I saw the sincerity in her soul. And in that moment, that's the moment that changed my life. Two things happened. I realized, one, I wasn't alone anymore. And two, 
it was so much bigger than me it was it was it was so much bigger than me because i couldn't understand how the worst day of my life could give anybody hope this lady told me this woman this phenomenal human is standing in front of me and her and and, and all of her brokenness and she's telling me that she got a little piece of hope from my worst day of my life and i can't even make people understand how much my life changed in that moment because now i didn't want to go back to who i was it took me a couple weeks but on march 21st 2013 i woke up and it was the first day i didn't want to die i always have hope for people because i watched my life go from wanting to die to now helping people who want to die and that happened in a small window like but it started from me accepting who i am and me just realizing that it's certain things that i have to do and i don't want any any any, any individual on the face of this planet to feel alone in their own troubles i want them to know that there's so many people dealing with the same thing is that we have to talk about these things it sounds like you find yourself to be a conduit to bring people together to help people know that they're not alone and if you had to give someone or anyone out there struggling with depression and suicidal ideation, if you had to give them any words of hope, what would you say? You just got to accept where you're at. You know, a lot of times we, we've been in this dark place for so long, we don't, we don't think we deserve to see it get better. And everybody deserves to see it get better. So if you're struggling right now, if you're doing something right now, it's somebody for one, I tell you, if you don't believe in anybody in the world is, is, is thinking about you, if you don't think nobody in the world is praying for you, I 100% am thinking about you. I care about you. I need you. And here's why I need you. you. Say, well, you know, you don't even know me. How you? I need you. I need you because this world was designed to have you. Because if the world wasn't designed to have you, you wouldn't be here. So you're here because it's certain, it's a purpose that you bring to the table that, that, that the world can't get any better. The world, in order to push the world forward, you have to do what you've been called to do. Whatever your purpose is. And if you don't know that is, then you need to write, let's, let's figure it out. Like let let's figure it out because you, nobody was a, is alive for no reason, and, and and it can't be done if you don't do it. Then we lose that void. The world is the way it is because people are are leave this world without fulfilling what they were supposed to do in this world. I've I've been lucky enough to realize my gift, and that's why I want people to see that they have a gift. If I have a gift after twenty two suicide attempts, after the, the 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 mistakes that I've made time and time again after life, then I I believe we all have one. I mean, that's just truth be told, and, and I stand firm on that. Kevin, you are one of the most unique people I've ever met. I am <laughs> so incredibly, incredibly lucky to get to have this personal conversation with you, knowing that we get to share it with the world. Thank you so much for sharing your unique journey and just your confidence and hope that everyone has a unique gift that they bring to the table and that we need them. We we got somebody got to be crazy enough. We're crazy. We, we're crazy enough to believe the world can't get any better. So why can't I be crazy enough to believe that it can get better? That's the way I live. I'm done preaching. Two things stood out to Kevin in the moment he said his life changed for the better. First, he realized he was not alone. Second, he embraced life as so much bigger than just him and his problems. With this vision of community, place, and purpose, he embarked into a hope-filled life. Your moment of transformation from despair to hope may not be as dramatic or abrupt as Kevin's was. It may be gradual or even boring, but that doesn't mean you're any less worthy of enjoying it. The world awaits your contributions. Above all, I want to reiterate, suicide is a leading cause of death in the U.S., but it is preventable. Help is always available, and you are not alone. You can learn more about the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org. That's AFSP.org. Most importantly, if you or a loved one is in crisis, please reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK or the Crisis Text Line, text T-A-L-K to 741-741 to chat with someone who can help. To get in contact with Kevin and find out more about his work, visit the Kevin Berthea Foundation, 
His website is kevinberthiafoundation.org. Mental Note is brought to you by Eating Recovery Center and Pathlight Mood and Anxiety Center. If you'd like to talk to a trained therapist to see if treatment is right for you, call them at 877-850-7199. If you're looking for a free support group, check them out at eatingrecovery.com slash support dash groups or pathlightbh.com slash support dash groups. If you like our show, sign up for our e-newsletter and learn more about the people we interview at mentalnotepodcast.com. We'd also love it if you left us a review on iTunes. It helps others find our podcast. Mental Note is produced and hosted by me, Ellie Pike, and directed and edited by Sam Pike. Till next time.